Hello, good afternoon. This is Dr. Golden. Today we're going to talk about HPV-driven head and neck cancer. A brief outline, we'll talk about HPV-related um, head and neck cancers. We'll talk about how the cancer spreads throughout the body. We'll talk about prevention and risk reduction and then address some common questions and concerns that we address with patients with this type of cancer. And then at the end, we'll provide some resources. So this is a picture of the human papillomavirus. Um, this virus spreads human to human through skin and mucosal infection. In the three areas in the human body it excels at infecting are the oropharynx, the genital skin and mucosa, and the mucous membranes and skin around the anus. There's about a 10% chronic carrier rate for this virus in the uh, human population. Um, in the U.S. population, about 10% of men will chronically carry HPV at any given point, and about 3.5% of women. So human papillomavirus can lead to several different types of cancers. Uh, in my world, the oropharynx is where these cancers pop up, and the oropharynx can, has four different subsites that can harbor these cancers, the soft palate, the tonsils, the posterior pharyngeal wall, which you think of as sort of the middle back wall of the throat, and the base of tongue. And these days, most oropharyngeal cancers that come into my clinic are HPV related. So in the old days, you used to get these the old fashioned way by smoking and drinking for 20 or 30 years. And these days, most of the time, we're not seeing those kinds of cancers pop up in the tonsil and the base of the tongue anymore. So HPV has really changed the game of cancers in this area for us. So the, you know, about 70% of new oropharyngeal cancers are HPV related, and that number goes up every single year. So where is the oropharynx? It's located behind the oral cavity. Um, you can examine the oral cavity pretty easy in clinic with just a flashlight and a tongue depressor, the oropharynx is much more difficult to see. Um, the four different subsites we've talked about already, this area is very rich in lymphoid tissue. So this is basically tonsil tissue, um, immune system tissue scattered in small pockets throughout the back of the throat. And this tends to be a site that harbors HPV infection much more commonly than other non-lymphoid areas inside the upper air digestive tract. When people get infected with HPV, most people will clear this viral infection on their own within two years. So if someone gets exposed to HPV, contracts the infection, you can actually test and find the viral DNA in the patient's secretions for six to nine months, and then slowly those numbers will drift down to zero, such that over 90% of people clear the virus totally within a couple of years without any intervention at all. You have a lower chance of getting rid of the infection if you have a couple of things. So uh, uh, non-normal immune system, so these would be people on chemotherapy, uh, people who have had transplants and have immune suppression to keep their transplant from rejecting, or people who have congenital problems with their immune system. Smoking decreases your chance of clearing the viral infection, and repeated exposures to different serotypes lowers your chance of clearing the viral infection. For head and neck cancers, the time between the exposure to the virus and the time of developing the cancer we think is about 20 years. The best evidence we have are that people who present with these cancers in their early to mid 50s are manifesting this from an infection they got in their late 20s to early 30s. And the reason for progression of the chronic viral infection to cancer is not known in many patients. So as far as spreading this virus, HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the U.S. You get it through genital contact, you get it through oral sex. And over 50% of sexually active people have had HPV. The number is probably closer to 75 or 80% actually. And it's extremely uncommon in those with no history of any sexual activity. Your risk of contracting oral human papillomavirus increases with the number of partners that you have, and people with a documented history of greater than 20 sexual partners have a very high rate of, of chronic carrier state HPV infection. So how does this relate to head and neck cancer? Well, this is 
completely changed the way these patients present to our clinic. You know, the old-fashioned head and neck cancer patient was a smoker and a drinker, very poor dental hygiene, and these days the more common person for us to see in our clinic is someone with little to no smoking history um, who developed a cancer without any of those classic risk factors. So it's changed my practice a lot in the last 10 years. Squamous cell carcinoma rates are falling for most of the head and neck subsides. So the oral cavity is sort of the front of the mouth, the larynx, the voice box, the hypopharynx, which is the lower part of the throat where the swallowing passages truly begin. Cancers in this area still come from tobacco and alcohol exposure. Our primary care physicians have become really good at talking people out of smoking and using smokeless tobacco. And subsequently, our cancer rates at all these other sites are going down significantly year to year. The exception for that is in the oropharynx, like we've talked about. And the patients that typically get these HPV-driven cancers are different. They tend to be younger, they tend to be more well-educated, they tend to be healthier, and they tend to lack those classic risk factors of high-level tobacco use. So how do these patients come to my clinic? Well, the old-fashioned HPV-negative head and neck cancers typically would show up in a lot of pain, a lot of bleeding out of their mouth, and they'd be very symptomatic from this. These days, most of the HPV-driven cancers show up with a neck mass and most of the time, no other symptoms. Occasionally, you can have other symptoms such as difficulty swallowing, pain with swallowing, or a sensation of just having a lump in the back of your throat, but the vast majority of patients pop up with a lump in the neck and no other trouble. The cancer that's driven by HPV tends to metastasize or move to the lymph nodes early. So the HPV negative cancers tend to start on the inside, smolder there for a while before they move to the lymph nodes. The opposite happens with the HPV driven cancers where the cancer will start, sometimes stay microscopically small and generate a lymph node full of cancer that can be several centimeters across in the neck. So it's a very different behavior pattern for these cancers. These cancers, thankfully, tend to respond very well to treatment, whether surgery, radiation, chemo, whatever treatment um, plan is decided upon by the team, patients tend to get rid of their cancer at a much higher rate than the older fashioned cancers. So much so that we actually stage these cancers different. So they're, the two cancers are both squamous cell carcinoma. They can both pop up in the same sites in the back of the throat. But if it's a virally driven cancer, the behavior is so different that the patients get a completely different staging system. Um, and that staging system is new as of January of 2018. So how do you keep yourself out of my office? Um, well, uh, you can limit sexual partners. And you know, we talked about how exposure to greater than 20 sexual partners increases your risk of being a chronic carrier for one of the viruses one of the family members of this virus that causes cancer. Um, clearly, if you can keep yourself with a strong immune system, that would be great. Oftentimes, that's not a choice you get to make in life, but um, uh, you know, not needing to have a, a kidney transplant or a liver transplant would be a good move on your part. Uh, condom use, so these, this does offer some limited protection. HPV is very good at moving person to person. Um, but the less skin and mucous membranes that come in contact with one another, the, the lower the rate of transmission is. And it's not 100% fix for HPV transmission because they don't cover the entire pelvis, at least when I took my sex ed class, they didn't cover the entire pelvis. I don't know if they have a new model out or something, but um, it can help, but it's not 100% preventative. Now, the main prevention is vaccination. So, um, vaccination currently is indicated for both genders. Uh, it's effective for boys and girls, and the FDA just expanded its indication several months ago for HPV vaccination up to age 45, but you can start as young as age 9. Vaccination is thought to be most effective before the start of sexual activity, so that's why we try to get kids vaccinated starting in the 9 to 11 year old range. Um, before sexual debut, before exposure to the human papillomavirus, that's when we have our best chance of preventing infection with the cancer-driving versions of this virus. So, 
you know, there are uh, over a hundred different types of HPV. We tend to just put numbers on them so it makes them easier to remember. There are four main types of HPV that, that we look for as far as uh, causing symptoms in the mouth. HPV 16 and 18 are the two that cause the vast majority of the HPV-driven cancers. 16 is the, the bad actor and causes most of them, but 18 is uh, sort of in second place. HPV 6 and 11 tend to not cause cancers, but they do cause the bulky, what we call the warty disease or the condylomatous disease. And this can pop up both in the mouth, the oropharynx, the anus, and the, and the genital tract. The good news is that the vaccines currently on the market cover both of the cancer-causing viruses, 16 and 18, and some vaccines will even cover up to nine or 10 different variants of the virus to try and decrease the transmission rate of this, this, uh, this cancer-causing virus even more. Um, boys and girls age 9 to 45 are eligible to receive the vaccine. We do try and get people vaccinated as young as possible uh, because our effectiveness in cancer prevention and HPV prevention is much higher the, the younger kids get vaccinated, mainly because, like we said, it's effective before you start sexual activity. We don't have any evidence that the vaccination will help clear a current infection. And right now, there's not a role for vaccination over age 45. And studies have shown that the HPV vaccine has decreased the amount of HPV infections and HPV-related cancers. Our best data comes from the cervical cancer literature because HPV 16 and 18 cause cervical cancer in ladies as well. And in Australia, where the vaccination rates are really high, they're seeing rates of HPV infection and cervical cancer just plummet, drop absolutely through the floor showing that the vaccination is very effective for these types of cancers. All right, so there's some uh, questions that people ask when they come into my clinic. There's some variation on this. College was pretty wild. Should I be tested for HPV? This is basically a patient saying, you know, I've had an exposure history. Um, should I go and get tested? Right now, the short answer is no. There are tests available to detect oral HPV as well as anogenital HPV, but in the oral cavity and the oropharynx, at least right now, these are experimental. Most of these HPV treatment, most of these HPV infections will clear on their own without intervention, which is good because we don't have a treatment for it in the oropharynx and the base of the tongue, even if it's found. There's not an antiviral medicine that you can be put on to help you clear one of these infections. So without an action to take from that result, we don't recommend having the test. So the short answer is no. My cancer tested positive for HPV. What does that mean for me? Well, in the head and neck, that's, that's quite a bit of meaning to it. It's actually good news. If you have to have a cancer in the back of the throat, you want it to be HPV driven. That means that the cancer is much more responsive to treatment and you're much more likely to be cured of your cancer and never see it again. But right now, it's not treated any differently than non-virally related cancer. The distant metastatic rate is still about 10%, meaning the chance that the cancer has moved somewhere else outside of the head and neck to the lungs or the liver or the brain, places like that. Um, so that rate's still about 10%. And treatment remains challenging to undergo. It's not a lot of fun having cancer treatment for any sort. If this infection is so common, why doesn't everyone have this cancer? Well, that's a good question. We know that about 90% of people exposed to HPV will clear the virus within a year or two. So that means 10% of the population is chronically carrying this. In the U.S., that's still about 30 million people. A very, very, very small percentage of that 30 million people goes on to develop this type of cancer. There's a lot of investigation going on right now trying to figure out what discriminates between someone who can clear the virus and not clear the virus, and what discriminates between someone who carries the virus and goes on to develop cancer. We don't have a lot of those answers yet, but there's a lot of work going on trying to get to the bottom of it. We do know factors that predispose to persistent infection include smoking, older age, and trouble with your immune system. Well, I give this virus or cancer to my spouse. Did they give it to me? This was the, you know, whose fault is it question or should we change what we're doing at home question. The best evidence we have indicates that the cancer develops from exposures over 10 years 
over 10 years ago, typically 20 to 30 years ago. And it's estimated that almost all sexually active adults have had an exposure to HPV at some point in their lives. So the best evidence we have is that long-term sexual partners have most likely already swapped what they're going to swap. We don't have any evidence that changing sexual habits, doing barrier precautions between long-term monogamous partners makes any difference at all in viral carrying rates or cancer development rates. You can take barrier precautions with new partners is what we tend to recommend. And HPV infection doesn't indicate promiscuity of either party. And should I get vaccinated? Well, we don't know that the vaccination does any good after you've been infected. Um, the FDA just recently raised the top end of the vaccination range from 26 to 45, um, but we don't have a lot of evidence that we're gonna be decreasing the cancer rates by vaccinating people after they've initiated sexual activity. But you should get your kids vaccinated and your nieces and nephews and your neighbor's kids. This is the main way that we're going to get rid of these cancers. Uh, it's going to take another 20 years of vaccinations, but uh, this is a cancer that we stand an excellent chance of curing and wiping out the population, just like I think we're going to do with the bulk of cervical cancers within the next 15 to 20 years. So I'm at Swedish, uh, we're located downtown, the First Hill campus. We now have three head and neck surgeons. One of my partners retired quite recently. Um, we take care of lots of people with cancer in the mouth, neck, uh, skin, salivary glands. And we do a lot of stuff down here, um, both minimally invasive and maximally invasive to take care of these patients. Uh, we got some resources for education. The SCI has a cancer education center that you guys can reach out to. The American Cancer Society has some excellent, excellent information pages on this type of cancer as well as HPV infection in general. And the CDC also has information on this that's pretty easy to access. Now, this is me. You guys can reach out if you have questions.